So we're glad that you've joined us today for the second part of Jonah entitled Cry for Justice. Bow your heads with me before we open God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you today and we praise you for the wonderful music, for taking us to your throne through song and through prayer. And as we open your word, Lord, we pray that you will address the needs of our hearts. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this story comes to us from India. There were two graduates from uh, engineering graduates who went for an interview applying to one of the most prestigious engineering institutes. And when they went for the interview, there was an individual who was notoriously known for being the hardest, most difficult interviewer around. The two friends came in, one waited to go an hour later. And so as the first guy went in for the interview, things were going well. He was feeling confident. And then the interviewer looked at him and he said, I have a question for you. You're traveling in a train moving at a high speed and it is getting very, very hot in your compartment. What will you do? Well, the candidate said, I will open the window. Good, said the interviewer. Now the window is one and a half square meters. The compartment you're in is about 12 and a half cubic meters. The train is moving at 60 kilometers an hour. The wind is blowing at 15 kilometers an hour. How long will it take for the compartment to cool down? The student stared blindly. He said, I, I have no idea. Okay, you failed. Get out of here, he says. He went out to his friend and he was upset. He said, I can't believe it. How did the interview go? He said, this guy's crazy. He's asking me about a, uh, if I'm in a train and I'm in a window with one and a half meters big, in a compartment that's 12 and a half cubic meters, the wind is blowing, and if it's hot, what would I do? And he tells his friend the story. Well, his friend went into the interview and again, things were going pretty well. The interviewer said the same thing. I have a question for you. You're traveling in a train moving at a high speed and it's getting very, very hot in your compartment. What will you do? He says, I will take my jacket off. Well, what if it's getting very, very hot? I'll take my shirt off. It's burning hot in that compartment. What will you do? Sir, I'll take my trousers off. What if you're about to die of a heat stroke or heat exhaustion? He says, what if you're about to die? He says, I don't care if I'm going to die. I'm not opening that window. Would rather die than search for the answer. Would rather die than search for the answer about what life and his mission is all about. And that's what I'd like to look at with you today. Our story will come from the book of Jonah. And we're going to pick up in the latter half of Jonah you know that Jesus confirms the historicity or the validity of Jonah. In Matthew chapter 12, it, is, it records a, a time there where Jesus was approached by the Pharisees and by the scribes, and they were trying to corner Jesus and asking him, demanding to see a sign. Lord, or teacher, they said, show us a sign, as if they had not seen enough signs of the Messiah. And Jesus says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he said, that's, that, what was that sign? That just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of this great fish, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. What is the sign of Jonah that Jesus speaks about? Jesus addresses the inquisitors, the religious leaders, and he says, I'm not going to show you another sign. Jesus never went about doing miracles or signs simply to pacify somebody's curiosity. Jesus never performed a sign or a miracle to satisfy his own need. But he told them the sign of Jonah will be, basically what that was, would be that they would be witness to the death and burial 
and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus affirms the historicity of Jonah. So with that in mind, take your Bibles and come with me to the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. Jonah chapter 3. And to review, my dear friends, you understand that Jonah is called by God to go to the Ninevites, a large city, over 120,000 occupants in the city. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And it was interesting that God would choose Jonah as the instrument to go and bring a message to the Ninevites. Jonah was a prejudiced man. He was a religious bigot. He had no affection whatsoever for the Gentiles, much less those wicked Ninevites. And boy, when I read this, does it give me comfort, my dear friends. You see, we're going to see it through this story is that our chief aim is to understand the heart of God. There are sermons that are intellectual and academic in nature where we learn things great. There are sermons that are filled with energy and emotion that give us and, and inspire our hearts great. But every message needs to some way take us to understand the heart of God. And I am encouraged when I read the sad story of Jonah because it tells me that God will often choose the unlikeliest, unworthy characters to do His work. And I am a living sign. God chooses Jonah, and He tells him and He sends him. And there it was that when Jonah would go finally after he was vomited from the belly or from this great fish, Jonah would go to Nineveh. You know, it's interesting that God's strategy for your life, graduates, that this message is for you as well and geared for you, God's strategy for your life does not change because you have chosen a detour. God's mission and His strategy and His plan for your life remains the same. So Jonah preaches the message, and it's interesting that it is five words in the Hebrew. The words that Jonah gives to the Ninevites is 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. In the Hebrew, it's only five words. What a lousy sermon. No mention about God. No mention about repentance for sin. Simply 40 more days and Nineveh shall be overturned. But even with that, the Bible records that the the Ninevites responded and they believed God. The king led in the revival and they, they were clothed with sackcloth. Even the cows repented, we are told. But what's interesting, verses 8 and 9 of Jonah chapter 3, it says, Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, the king says, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that he will not perish. You see, my dear friends, here you have a repentance of the people that Jonah reluctantly went. Here you have a people, and there is no mention of them doing a sacrifice. You know that oftentimes there will be people that will not be aware of all of the workings of religion, but yet will be accepted by God because they've humbled themselves before Him. And the Ninevites... Much to Jonah's chagrin, repented and changed away. And this brings us to Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Notice what it says. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Here was Jonah, and the Bible records, did did you see how he felt? He was angry. And he said, I knew it. 
I knew that you would find some way to forgive them. I knew that you were too compassionate and gracious of a God that to destroy the city. I knew it. And the Bible records that Jonah was angry. Interesting to note that the chapter tells us that he goes and he builds himself some sort of shelter. He, so he exits the city. He goes and he sits in a place where he can oversee the city. He builds himself some sort of shelter. The Lord provided a plant. Another translation says a gourd or a gourd or a vine to give shade over his head. It must have been this vine with large leaves. And the Bible tells us there that Jonah was very happy. By the way, it's the only time in the whole book that this brother was happy. The following morning, God causes a worm to chew on the vine. If it is withered, then the sun would begin to rise and began to intensely heat up. And God sent a scorching wind. And I'll tell you, a scorching wind in the heat of a desert is no relief. If you've ever been in a hot desert, the wind actually almost multiplies the heat as the skin recoils. And the Bible tells us that Jonah grew faint and he wanted to die. He says, it would be better for me to die than to live. Why such a big deal? Why the attention to the fact that Jonah uh, was discomforted under the sun? Something interesting is that, you know that Jonah is mentioned another time in the book Um, in the Old Testament, in the book of 2 Kings. But it's a fascinating story of the Shunammite woman. And you'll find this in 2 Kings chapter 4. Now, Jonah is mentioned later by name. But in chapter 4 of 2 Kings, there's this fascinating story of the Shunammite woman. Elisha the prophet goes and he stays with her and her husband. And the one thing that that Elisha performed, a miracle with the woman, was that he pronounced that she would have a son. The Bible records that the son of the Shunammite woman, must have been a young lad, went out into the field, out to the harvest where his father was, and there, under perhaps what may have potentially been heat stroke or was sunstruck, the boy begins to cry, my head, my head, And later, it's recorded that he dies. Well, Jewish tradition says that that boy, that son of the Shunammite woman, would later grow up to be the prophet Jonah. We don't have record of that or evidence in the Scripture. Ellen White doesn't mention that. But if you notice the chronology of Jonah's life, it fits rather peculiarly. Jonah, back to our story. The Bible records in chapter 4 of Jonah multiple times. It says in verse 1 that Jonah was greatly displeased and he became angry. Verse 4 tells us, but the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? Another translation says, is it well for you to be angry? A little bit later, when the vine or the plant is chewed up and withers, the Bible again records that Jonah was at the point where he wanted to die, and God asks him in verse 9, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? To which he answers, I do. I am angry enough to die. And you know what? Good thing that this is written for us in the English. Because if you were to understand the Hebrew response, in Hebrew, the response of Jonah, it would be almost an expletive. He he said, I am bleepity bleep angry. And God asks him, do you have a right to be angry? And I'd like for us to look at this here for just a moment. Why was Jonah angry? Well, you might say, according to his mind, justice was not served. To Jonah, 
He was angry because of the mercy that God bestowed upon Nineveh, and he didn't destroy them. Why was Jonah angry? What he had expected would happen or preached would happen did not happen. And perhaps now, Jonah, in a way, you have made me a liar, God. Jonah is angry. But twice, God asks him, have you any right to be angry? Beloved, we get angry when we don't get what we want. And what we want, we often feel that we deserve. He felt he was owed something by God that he didn't come through on. After all, you sent me all the way to Nineveh. You owe me, God. Anger often takes place in a various or a variety of ways, but the very root of anger comes from the foundation that something is owed to you. Show me an angry person, and I'll show you a hurt person. And I guarantee you that that person is hurt because something has been taken. They were owed something. Listen, I know people. They were promised a promotion. You were promised that promotion, and then they didn't get it. Angry. That young person, angry that her father had left her mother and her when she was but a child. You robbed me of my years with you. Angry. You took my reputation. You took the best years of my life. You owe me a raise. You robbed me of my purity. Angry. A priest serving in, in, El, in the country of El Salvador during the time of, of political violence said these powerful words as he was serving the people there. He says, there are many things that can only be seen through the eyes that have cried. There are many things that can only be seen through the eyes that have cried. You see, we experience anger, we experience hurt because something that we believe was owed or due to us was either taken or it didn't come through. Jonah was angry because he believed that God owed him, that God withheld the justice that the Ninevites, he believed, so well deserved. So what did Jonah want? What did Jonah feel he was entitled to? I am bleepity bleep angry, says Jonah to his prayer to God. And I can imagine. You want to see justice, Jonah? You want to see them destroyed? And yet you, God's people, privileged to receive the covenant blessings, you have hated correction. You have refused to acknowledge your sins, and you have hated to be reformed. And yet, you want to see justice. You see, my dear friends, when you misunderstand the justice and grace of God, you will be discontent with Him. And Jonah was angry because justice as he understood it, was not served. Jesus turns our understanding of just and fairness on its head. You recall the story of the prodigal son. Pastor Anastasia mentioned, what's going on in this story? The son who leaves the house, who takes his possessions his, his earning, the father's uh, allotted inheritance, he takes that and he squanders it on a life that he had chosen. And yet, after some period of time, he returns. The Bible says that he came to his senses and he was received by his father who sees him from a distance 
And Jesus records in that story that the father ran to his son, threw his arms around him, embraced him, and kissed him, and then said, hey, we got to celebrate because this my son who was dead is now alive. He who had left has now returned. What is going on here? You know, if we were that younger son, you would thank God that you were received by your father and not the older brother. Let's rewrite Scripture for just a moment. Let's say that the older son is the one receiving the younger when he returns. And this would be the older son. What are you doing here? You have no right to be here. You have chosen your lifestyle. You have decided what to do. You are no longer welcome here. You have made your choice. That would have been how the older son would have received his brother. And the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 15 that while this party celebration is going on, that the older brother catches wind of something taking place, and he asks one of the servants, hey, what is going on here? And he says, your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back. The Bible tells us that the older brother became angry, and he refused to go in. He was angry. Why? Because justice has not been carried out on this younger son who left and decided to live his own way. And so the older brother, rightfully, perhaps you might even argue, became angry. There's another story that Jesus tells. It's a strange story. And it's about this landowner who hires laborers for his vineyard. You can read that in Matthew chapter 20. But the landowner goes out very early in the morning and he hires these laborers and they've agreed, he has agreed to give them a day's wages. The landowner goes out again at 9 o'clock and then again at 12 noon. Later, he would go on at 3 in the afternoon. And even at 5 p.m., the landowner is bringing laborers to work his vineyard. They have all agreed to receive what was their due. But what's the interesting twist in that story is that the landowner calls his foreman and he tells him, go call the laborers to pay them their wages, but begin with the last, beginning with the last ones hired all the way to the first. And so all the laborers, the workers, are lined up beginning with the ones that came in last. And the landowner pays them their wages. And then the next set, and the next set, well, surely the ones that were there from early in the wee hours, sees, they see this and they're like, well, hey, we're going to get more. We've deserved more because we've labored under the sun and we have been here all day. And the landowner gives them what they had agreed upon, a day's wages. And the Bible says that they were angry. They grumbled against the landowner. You see, beloved, when you misunderstand the justice and grace of God, you will be discontent with Him. Why does Jesus tell this story? And why have the ones who came in first witness what was done to those who came in later? You see, beloved, Jonah had no affection whatsoever for the Ninevites. But Jonah was concerned with the vine that gave him shade. He had taken pity on the plant. And God says, should I not be concerned about that great city? That great city, the people don't even know their right hand from their left, Jonah. You see, beloved, let me tell you, 
our sense of justice will always be distorted if we have no love for the offenders. Our sense of justice will always be distorted if we have no love for the offenders. And today we're living in a time in society where there is anger and hurt. There are people today, even aside from what's been going on in in, in the social climate of our day, who have lived with anger. Something is owed you, you feel. Something is owed to you. Something was taken. You're angry. And sometimes, very possible and often likely, we get angry with God. I've talked to some of our young people. They're angry with the church. Angry with the church. What are you going to do? What is the response? We're angry. But it's, we will always have a distorted understanding of what justice will ultimately look like or should look like if there is no love for the offenders. And by the way, this applies to those that work within the law who have been tasked with the job of caring for and protecting and serving their constituents. If there is no love for the offenders, there is no right to administer justice. And this also applies to those who may have been perpetrated against, who are demanding justice. And we may have drawn up what that picture looks like, but either way, it will be a distorted sense of justice if there is no understanding of the heart of God and no love for the offenders. Romans chapter 9, verses 14 through 16 say, This is the Apostle Paul. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Is there unrighteousness with God? He goes on to say, by no means. And then he quotes something that God said to Moses. He says, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Jonah was angry with God. And you and I can sit here and say, you know what, rightfully so. Because these Ninevites, I've read in one place, they were so wicked that they would often take the skulls of these conquered people or nations and they would wear them as necklaces. They were wicked people. They had oppressed Israel, and Jonah knew they had every right to be destroyed. But we would not understand the heart of God when these people turned in repentance to Him. But you know what, beloved? Perhaps the greatest injustice ever committed on this earth that punishment and the justice due to a guilty race was laid on the spotless Son of God. The one who created every person in His image, the Bible says He became sin for us. He who was in every sense God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God or something to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant and made himself in the likeness of a human flesh. And he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. That was the greatest injustice. Why? Why would he do it? Because he valued your life over his own. And the one who values you most is the one to whom you belong. Let me close with this story. As a graduation gift, a father gave to his son 
a car that he had acquired many years ago. It was several years old, but before he said to his son, before I give it to you, take it to the used car lot downtown. Tell them that I want to sell it and see how much they offer you. The son comes back and he says, Hey, father, they offered me $1,000 because it looks very worn out. The father said, Take it to the pawn shop. The son returned after taking it to the pawn shop. He said, Father, they offered me $100 because it was a very old car. The father tells his son, Now take it to the car club and show them the car. The son had returned from the car club excited. Some people in the club offered me $100,000 for it because it is a Nissan Skyline R34, an iconic car and sought after by many. And the father said to his son, I want you to know that you will face situations and places where you are not valued. Find the right place that values you the right way. Those who know your value are those who appreciate you. And never stay in a place where no one sees your value. Beloved, there is no justification why we as a people have failed to do what, what God has called us to do. None. And there is no reason why anybody should feel that they are less valued in the context of his church. Let the church be the people who live justice. And what is living justice? To courageously make other people's problems my own. That's what Jesus did. It's interesting that the book of Jonah ends with a question, and Jonah never answers it, perhaps because that question was a mirror to you and to me, the reader. And the question is this, are you okay with God loving those whom you call enemies? Are you okay with that? God calls upon His people today to stand collectively and to be a people that live justly, who love mercy, and who walk humbly with their God. If your desire today is to draw near to the heart of God, to understand His righteousness, His grace, and that justice, I invite you to surrender and give your heart to him just now. And I'd like to pray for you just before our, our worship leaders sing. Father, we pray today that you would draw close to us, that you would alleviate our hurts, that you would put a soft hand over the anger, and that you would bring restfulness to a restless soul and that we would catch a glimpse into the heart of God. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.